guys, in front of me is the engine out of the Streamliner that I went uh, 331 miles an hour in. I wanted to put a fresh engine in the liner because I didn't know how it was living because I'd never done anything this wild with one of my engines. One of my concerns was when you put the liner into third gear, the engine goes all the way down to 6,000 RPM. And while it was at 6,000 RPM, it had a lot of boost present. And the way that the wastegates were mounted to the up pipe, there wasn't really a good enough flow available to have reasonable boost control. And I was basically modulating the throttle to control both engine speed and manifold pressure while driving this uh, oddly incredible automobile. So <clears throat> we're here in Arizona, we've got a minute. We're gonna take this engine apart, see if there's anything fun to be seen and share with you guys and get it off to the machine shop to be freshened if it needs it to go back in the car to do this hopefully again next year. So one of the first things I noticed is the camshafts look extremely good. And I'm interested to see the buckets. The engine ended up kind of spending a lot of time over 8,500. 8700 RPM, but it was basically driving at a very high rate of engine speed for um, I think around a mile. So I'm curious to see how the buckets fared, but so far all of the cam lobes on the Brian Crower cams look really excellent. So on one hand, you could say that this engine doesn't have very many miles on it because it doesn't, uh, I guess less than 10 miles, but um, when you equate the engine speed and load that it had seen to do the record run and the backup run, um, it's a lot of quarter mile passes if you wanna um, make sense of it that way. One of the things that has me uh, the most concerned about the Streamliner is the gearing. It only has three forward speeds because it's just using a TH400. And the problem with that is the ratio drops. So it's a stock ratio TH400, so it goes from a 248 first gear to a 148 second gear to a 103rd gear. So you have these really large engine speed drops where even if you shifted the engine at 9,000 RPM, the engine speed still falls too low. The lower the engine speed, the longer the cycle time is, and the longer the cycle time is, the longer the engine is under stress with every uh, revolution. So if you think about how an engine sounds at 10,000 RPM, yes, it's going very fast, but it's basically just taking um, very fast jabs of uh, high load and pressure, and a lot of them. I knew that when the thing was on a rip and I put it in third gear, I looked down and I saw the manifold pressure over 400 kPa. And um, that was alarming to me because I knew the engine speed was low and the boost was high. That's a recipe for uh, disaster because there's so much stress happening um, for a long time during every engine cycle. Ideally, you would have an engine like this that on the shift point, it would only turn down to say uh, 7,000 RPM instead of 6,000 RPM or 7,500 RPM. We're gonna see things we hadn't seen before and maybe there's something to see or maybe there's not anything to see. So looking at the intake side of the cylinder head, the buckets look really nice. You know, you have very uniform character and it's still very polished looking. There's no ridges. The cam lobes don't show any distress, which is pretty exciting. Let's peel the exhaust out and see how it looks. So I've got the exhaust cam out and looking down the camshafts on most of the engines that I've taken apart, whether they have a cast camshaft or a steel camshaft, um, the majority of the problem I've seen has always been in uh, the one, two, and three uh, cylinders on the exhaust side. And here's the oil feed. So the oil comes up from the bottom end of the engine, feeds here first crosses over the head, travels up through the camshaft and lubricates this camshaft. So this is your furthest point from the oil entering the system. And as you move forward, there is some very, very light 
beginning to be distress on these three cylinders. There are manufacturers that have specific instructions of what they feel will offer the best longevity to the customer. That includes uh, if you are moving to a steel camshaft, you would use a coated bucket and the coated bucket offers you more protection against damage when the lubrication has been displaced. So oil entering, the last guys to get oiled, and the most amount of wear. So it's not like this very difficult um, equation to figure out. This engine was driven over 8,500 RPM for um, you know at least a mile, which is pretty crazy when you put that in the context of um, any other types of racing. Land speed racing definitely has its um, merit. It's why it was the proving ground and has been the proving ground for a lot of components for a very long time because the amount of time the engine is under stress. In case you're wondering, this engine has a stock size ARP 625 head stud kit, which we use through our experience of going sixes with a stock block with a janitor. It was never really a problem to face with a stock engine block. This engine does have a firing head gasket, which we can stare around on and see if we had any leaks. There is a fair share of corrosion. When they came back from Bonneville, it just sat and they didn't flush the fuel out of it. So we'll look around a little bit and see if we have any combustion stain coming out of the cylinders. Maybe it was lifting the head. That was really my main concern when I went into high gear um, was that it was gonna lift the head. Now we have a really neat turbo system that Steve Watt at Maxwell Engineering has built for us. And Steve Watt is no stranger to the game. He's heavily involved in the Speed Demon, which is the pinnacle of land speed racing right now, as far as a race car goes. But what I'll be able to do now is have less boost at 6,000 RPM and more boost at 9,000 RPM. And I'll trail the load into the engine as the engine speed increases. So I can kind of mitigate the stress with better boost control, which is pretty exciting. When you get into combustion leaks, um, bridging the ceiling ring, whether it be a composite gasket, a multi-layer steel gasket, or what we're doing here with these rings is the combustion will generally leave a trace. So on the head side, it looks pretty good. We've got some action here on number one. So if you take a look at the top of the block, the color and discoloration on this side of the block is different than this side of the block. And as you move down the block, you'll see a little bit more of that. So back on number six, it looks like it's the worst, but it's lifting the head. You know, if you take and put 40 pounds of boost in an engine at 4,000 RPM or at 5,000 RPM, the load that the engine sees is quite a bit different than if you were at 8,000 RPM or 9,000 RPM. OEM Toyota stuff, you gotta give it to the guys. They, they really gave us a killer platform to work on, but it, it's got its limitations. There is um, a fair share of corrosion back here on number six. It would be hard to say how that would look had the engine come back to the owner's house and he um, flushed the race gas out of it, ran it on pump gas or ran it with a fogging oil and put oil back in because race gas, whether it be gasoline or alcohol based is still pretty dry. It doesn't have as much lubricity as uh, pump gasoline, but we're gonna get that cylinder apart and you can see that it looks pretty cruddy in there. Right off the hit, uh, discussing what I was discussing before about distance from the oil pump. Here we are, we pull the number one and the rod, number six rod, the bottoms off and the bottom side of the number six rod bearing is in distress. Let's continue to take it apart, but you know, keep in mind as you take an engine apart, when you start to look at troubles, ask yourself, how does the oil system work in your particular engine? There are engines that will oil on the ends and starve the rods in the middle. So every engine is going to be a little bit different. 
but you want to try to think through the process multiple steps. Now, probably the worst thing about this disassembly video is a lot of time's gone by. So you're, you're kind of arriving at an aging crime scene that, for example, the corrosion in number six, if we would have taken this engine apart within a few days of the event, we'd have a very good understanding of why it was there, where it was from, whereas now you, you don't know exactly what had happened because so much time has is, is gone by. It's digging, out, digging up a year old body and trying to figure out what happened to it, you know? So let's get the rod and piston out and let's look at the upper. So at nearly TDC on the number one rod bearing, you can see that it's started to remove the coating and the coating is pretty awesome. These are a King coated bearing. It's cool that we're not far back with this damage because it, if you have the ignition timing um, too far advanced, then you'll start to mark the rod bearing earlier and earlier on. And we did have uh, relatively low ignition numbers in the engine, but we still have this mark right here, just about 12 o'clock in the uh, rod bearing. This piston is just the piston you would buy. You know, it's a turbo tough manly piston. It's, it's a shelf component. Uh, this is a shelf connecting rod. That's a stock crankshaft. Like the Jay-Z is a really awesome engine to be able to even do this stuff. And I think that a lot of us, especially in modern times, because we're so spoiled with good hardware, we overlook uh, just how good stuff has um, gotten. If you look at the skirt coating, you've got some removal of the skirt coating here, but also on the other piston, the other side of the piston. So both the thrust and the non-thrust side of the piston have fairly equal marks. The ring land's not pinched, the ring still moves around freely, and we'll pop the piston pin out in a few minutes and take a look at it and take a look at the pin bore because that may also tell some story. Because of the corrosion, that bore's pretty nasty. The piston doesn't want to slide out. We have the same mark up here in the 12 o'clock area of the rod bearing. Piston pin rotates okay. A little less scuffing on the skirt of this piston, but keep in mind that whenever I do these engines, I, uh, I have less timing and more fuel in number six than I do uh, the other cylinders. But I do have a fair share of yucky going on where the coating has come off and the rod bearing is looking pretty nasty. Uh, ring lands are clean as far as uh, getting squished. You know, if you've ever squished a ring land, the, the detonation comes down on the top of the piston, forces the ring land down and then the ring is pinched while we still have uh, rings that move around fine. Hmm. More of that delaminating on the number two lower bearing. More delaminated on the lower number five rod bearing. So one thing you have to keep in mind through this process is uh, the OEM crank oils different than, a, than an aftermarket crank. It doesn't have direct oiling. The, the oiling galley is basically teed off. So as the oil comes up out of the main and heads to the rod bearing, it hits a a T intersection that the oil has to change direction and go out of the crank both ways. And if you read a engine building book from 25 or 30 years ago, no one really liked that because they wanted direct oiling. They wanted the oil to come up off the main bearing through the main galley and travel directly to the rod bearing without having to turn. And one of the complaints going back into those old books was at high RPM, the oil can't get out of the crank uh, well because of centrifugal force. I can share that information with you because it was what I it was what I was taught when I was a younger person, and maybe that's what's going on here. But uh, this is one of one for me. I've never taken a part of steel rod engine that I've driven, you know, over eight thousand RPM for, you know, this long. So here is our number five upper. Shows a little bit more wear, right at the twelve o'clock. As far as ignition timing goes, if you think about this, um, as the engine is rotating, you know, it's in the engine like this. And as the engine comes up and it's pushing up the bore, if you have your ignition timing 
too early and it detonates, it's going to have um, tremendous cylinder pressure and it's going to be pushing back down on that piston. And you'll see that in the rod bearing because it will displace the oil. But on this one, it is just right about 12 o'clock is where it's, it's displaced the oil and it's started to uh, wear the coating off the rod bearing. Looking at the skirts, we're in the same boat, a little bit of wear, rings move around well, piston pin rotates well. When you're taking an engine apart that you, um, you suspect that it may have had some trauma, rotate the piston pins because if you have a bent pin, you'll feel it stick uh, with your fingers and you know to look there because when you go to remove the piston pin, chances are it's raised the edges of the pin bore up just slightly if it's been detonating, you know, if you've watched some of our past videos, you've seen me slide pins out with my fingertip or have to hammer them out with a hammer. That's because the, the ends of the pin bores get chewed up a little bit, but being able to rotate the pin um, in the piston pin bore and have it be free, you know, the pin's not bent. So, so far, no bent pins. These are the shelf pins that come with the Manly Pistons. They're nothing exotic. Um, but we do have the same damage on the lower rod bearing as we've started to see uh, kind of as a trend here. Kind of a similar thing here. We have um, just a little bit of wear right there at the middle of the upper rod bearing. The bearing clearance, for those of you that uh, geek out about that, we have um, around two and a half thousandths on this engine of uh, vertical oil clearance. We may open that number up uh, after looking at the upper rod bearing, but we need to understand what's happening with that lower rod bearing first. Pin bore rotates freely. Skirts have about the same wear that we've seen so far. Ring gland is not pinched and we move on. One of the things that's been really cool to be out here in Arizona working on these cars this week is um, just looking at the liner. I've done a fair share of neat things in my life and um, you know I've survived riding a motorcycle since I was 18 years old. But to look at the liner as an adult and um, having uh, driven it before, uh, for those of you that have seen the movie Step Brothers, when he walks by the room and he sees the drum set and the music plays in his head, uh, the liner has a very similar effect with me because I, I've just never done anything that awesome before. Um, uh, all the automotive related things have all been a certain level and uh, the liner is really nirvana because it, uh, it, it just kind of takes you to a different place when you get strapped in that thing and they put the lid on it and you look down the course and you know that with a very small amount of horsepower, the thing goes over 300 miles an hour. You know, there, there are guys that know land speed racing and they said, well, that's not very fast for a car like that. And they're right because we, we it was our first time out, you know, allow us to make some mistakes um, while we shake a new race car down, a new combination down but it still went over 300 miles per hour. So when you, uh, when I look at it, knowing that it's taken me uh, on a ride like that, it gives a pretty strong vibe even after a year. That's the, the one thing that I, I haven't been able to achieve through um, riding motorcycles. And I've, you know, I've ridden on a road course and it's, it's really neat. Um, I've gone sixes in the quarter mile and that's really neat. But uh, Bonneville and a liner, I don't think there's anything um, that you're going to do on the ground, uh, that's, uh, as intense as, uh, as drive one of those cars are super crazy. More delaminating on the lower rod bearings. And the same printing, just a little bit more on the number four cylinder than we've seen so far. Another place to look for vibration is the, you know, just like you have their main cap. So where your main cap bolts to the block right there in the saddle on the flat, when you detonate the engine or rattle the engine or the engine picks up a harmonic, um, you have vibration and the vibration shows as it transmits those pieces are rubbing together. 
And if you look at the parting line on your connecting rods, you may see some of that vibration present. And um, throughout this engine, it looks like there's a slight amount of that going on right at the parting line. So if you look at the surface here, you can see that the cap is moving around with some vibration right there at the parting line of the connecting rod. Piston pin bore is good. And we have a little bit more of the skirt wiping off on this piston. And number four is showing a little bit more skirt wear than the other pistons. Now this car has a Motec system on it, which has really, really high level knock control. And because it's on gasoline, we'll be able to take advantage of that in some contexts. Same thing on the upper rod bearing, just right at 12 o'clock, we've displaced the oil, started to rub the coating off. The uh, skirt wear looks about the same and the piston pin bore feels good. We can scroll down these pistons from one to six and we can look at that wear in the upper rod bearing. And this is one of the really neat things you get when you take an engine apart that hasn't destroyed itself and you're just looking to learn. The cylinder with the least amount of ignition timing has the least amount of coating worn off. So one and six are my soft cylinders and four I need to pay more attention to because I've got more of that oil displaced from cylinder pressure. And the other thing that you have to kind of lob into that thought is, would this look any different with a proper racing crankshaft? So if you get a proper racing crankshaft like a Brian Crower crank, it's got the direct oiling and that may in its own just change the character that you're seeing right now with the rod bearing wear. The crank turns very smooth. It's, uh, it's free when you move it here or move it here. It doesn't have a sticky point. And when you have a crankshaft that's bent, you know, it may, it may rotate fine like this and then you turn it and it's sticky because that's where it's touching down. This crank feels nice. Another thing that happens with an engine that has um, seen a lot of stress is the main saddles can relax and the main caps can get loose. So as you race an engine over time, you may notice that one or more main cap gets loose in its saddles. And currently these all look like they're good and they should pop back up out of the block with as much, um, force or resistance as it took to go into the block. So our main saddles, one through seven, feel good. And we're on to some main bearings. So this main bearing looks excellent. We have that. Of course, it's using real steep billet cap, which we're super proud of. Second main bearing looks very nice. Another excellent looking main bearing. This one also looks very nice. And here are our thrust washers. So this is the thrust washer that sees the torque converter pushing against it. And here's the one that's facing forward and um, they both look very nice. So torque converter doesn't look like it's trying to push the crankshaft out of the engine, which is pretty cool. It's been my experience that the majority of the vibration present in the main saddle is on the number five main and looking at it, it looks pretty nice. So we don't have to really talk much about that. That main bearing looks good. And last but not least, number seven main bearing looks nice also. Again, using the King coated bearing, it's a, it's a nice part, it's a nice coating. Get the crank up out of it. So when you look at the back of the crankshaft, if, um, if you've been rattling the engine a lot, you'll see that the flywheel vibrates and it will 
stand up and make all sorts of nasty material. And this one looks pretty nice. So the nose of the crankshaft looks good. The back of the crankshaft looks good. The finish on the crankshaft looks good. Even though those rod bearings were delaminating, looking at the finish of the crankshaft still looks very nice. There's some dirt on it because I'm contaminating it with the grime that's in the cylinders and, and whatnot that's all over the bench. But um, the surface on the crank looks pretty good. Upper main bearings and main saddles look nice. Again, got a good looking thrust washer, which is pretty exciting because the transmission combination and torque converter is new to the car. And you could take an engine apart with a new combination and the thrust is knocked out of it. And you've got to now fix that problem. So you're, you could have an otherwise beautiful engine with a ruined thrust bearing. And that's not happening right now on this engine. So that's another thing that you can count as a small victory. So looking at the deck of the block, it does bring back some memories because when we were doing the, uh, you know, we kind of had, had this goal of going sixes in the quarter mile with a stock block as people moved into billet blocks. We were still racing a stock block. It was wet. I worked hard to get the cylinder head um, sealing the best we could with commonly available strategy because there's some exotic strategies, but you could spend a hundred thousand dollars and not end up in a better position. So I was using affordable common strategies to try to solve my head gasket problem. And it got pretty good. But the deformation that I was experiencing was on the block side and it was as the block moved around, it would uncover the combustion and it would leak. And on this engine, it's the same scenario. The head side of the gasket looks really nice and the block side of the gasket has some combustion chase. We could speculate that as I continue to do stuff like this, I'll learn and protect the engine better from uh, this type of problem. The reality of the situation from my vantage point is it's a stock block and it's a really good stock block, but it's still a stock block that when it left Toyota, it made 320 horsepower and you got some guy that wants to run it um, over 40 pounds of boost under these high stress situations. And it's, it's gonna show some, uh, some effect of that. You have to be accepting that as we ask more and more from OEM parts, we'll find the weak points. And it's no different than anything else that's mechanical. If you take a component that was engineered to do one thing and you continue to add stress, you will find the weak points. And looking at this engine block looking down the deck if i had a flat stone i could drag it around on the deck and see that it's going to be moving around because you've got the forces of the head hardware pulling up you've got combustion you've got uh whatever torsional stuff could be going on like it's a hard life and uh and i'm just happy that i can you know even if this engine was junk and i wasn't going to reuse anything and it was just a sacrifice. It still took me over 300 miles an hour and gave me uh, an incredible experience that I'll um, remember for the rest of my days. So it's, uh, it's worth celebrating from that aspect for sure. So we talked earlier about the piston pin sliding out easily with your fingertip and there's one of them. And as you look into the upper pin bore, you can see this area here what you're getting is the piston will flex and displace the oil and then the, the pin will touch down and it'll start to rub that area of the pin bore. If this engine had a trend um, pin, I, I feel, I feel uh, experienced enough with it that I would say like you wouldn't see that. But these are shelf components and they're incredibly awesome shelf components. You're never going to be able to create um, an environment like this on a on a regular racetrack this is land speed racing and the stress is high for a long period of time so you're accepting of things like that you don't you're not going to create those types of problems in your thousand horsepower super they're just you, you can't create the stress it's just not present because you don't have a four or five mile track to hold your car wide open throttle so a little bit of that going on the pin bushing looks good 
and we will move to number two. Pen comes out with the fingertip. No hammering required. Pin board looks about the same. A little bit more force to get this one out. And just a little bit more of that wear present, you know, the, the piston and pin flex. So looking at this number four piston pin bushing, there is some heat in the bottom of the bushing. So I'll have to go back and look and see what the oil clearance was like and make sure that it wasn't tight. It's either that or maybe an oil temperature related problem. Well, that one slid out very nicely. A little less action on that pin bore. Bushing looks okay. Number six has, I would say, the most amount of action in the pin bore. Nothing tragic, nothing like you're, you're gonna blow up about because it can get pretty bad in a pin bore, but you can see that it's changed the finish of the pin bore here. So the, the pin bore will have a cross hatch, just like a, just like a um, cylinder wall will. And we've rubbed that away as the oil is displaced and the metal parts meet. Hey guys, back at Real Street, and I've done some research on what's going on with that lower rod bearing. So I spoke with both Joe at FFRE and a high level OEM Dodge engineer, and they both suggested the same thing. This problem is occurring during D cell. And as they explained it to me, I thought about it like when you're on a swing set as a kid and you get swinging too high that the chain slacks and then it kind of like yokes you back into shape as gravity comes back into play that type of sensation was going on inside the engine on the long decel. So after a run, let off the gas, the car's decelling in gear. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna move to a clean neutral. So after a run, we can just bump the transmission into neutral and the engine will fall to an idle and avoid all that hard deceleration load that it was facing before. And that should get the problem to go away. Anyhow, it's cool to find a new problem and shortly thereafter work towards a new solution. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this video and I'll catch you next time.